this session three. We have three speakers, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Professor B.K. Jain, and Dr. Ashish Kumar Singh. So uh, before I invite our first speaker, who is online from Germany, so I'll just uh, read out a brief CV. Dr. Chandrasekhar is presently at Max Planck Institute of Chemical Physics of Solids, Dresden, Germany. He did his PhD from BHU, MSc from BHU, and uh, BSc from VBS Purvanchal University. His area of interest is study of fundamental aspects of topological, magnetic, and superconducting materials, also crystal growth, quantum phenomena. So, sir, a very warm welcome to you, to this uh, program. And, uh, sir, can you hear me properly? Yeah, okay. I can hear okay. you. So, sir, uh, please go ahead, sir. Kindly. Okay. So, let me start just. So, thank you so very much for your kind introduction. And so, thank you also for this organizing this committee to invite me for this, this talk. So just now I'm going to talk about my some outgoing research work, which was we are doing some electrical and so thermal transport property of some topological material. So actually topological material is a new uh, phenomena in, uh, in condensed matter physics, which one so recently recognized in uh, material science. But uh, topology is well known in mathematics. So when we change uh, so, so, so geometry of uh, any shape, so property will uh, remain same. So how these property we, we recognize in in in, a, in a, any uh, material? So such uh, phenomena we we are working here in Max Planck Institute. So, uh, out of many phenomena, and one of the best example is quantum anomalous, uh, this quantum Hall effect. So, quantum Hall effect basically uh, is recognized in uh, low dimensional material where we measure a quantum Hall, this conductivity. Conductivity is the uh, multiplication of uh, these two fundamental constants. That means uh, uh, the conductivity always remain the same quantity independent of the shape of material. For example, if we measure, if we recognize in this rectangular shape of <laughs> material, so value will be remain e square by e, e square by h in so term of e square by h. This um, this, uh, this this conductivity. And as if we deteriorate this shape of, and so uh, I mean geometry of this uh, measuring sample, so conductivity will uh, remain the multiple of e square value. So um, if we deteriorate uh, more, then also it <laughs> remain the same. That means this uh, this, um, this property of quantum anomalous. Hall, this quantum Hall effect is the independent of the shape of and the geometry of material. This uh, this is the one of the best example in a topological material which can explain the phenomena. So and and there are many type of topological material nowadays and it's best known as a so topological insulator. So what happened in so topological insulator or any material, if we have a, some conduction band and balance band, and so depending upon the spin orbit, uh, the coupling of this material, uh, and which is inherent property, and sometimes this balance band below the conduction band. That means we have a band inversion. Band inversion means uh, this conduction band uh, uh, become balance band and balance band so become conduction band. So due to splitting of this band, so what happened after this inversion? 
this automatically we have a band gap that is called the inverted band gap not a normal band gap inverted band gap due to this in, uh, uh, inversion of the band gap this so we have a, a, a surface state on the surface this surface state is uh, very robust which is a metallic but not a normal uh, metal where a spin and momentum is locked so together and uh, this so this person is called the Dirac or, or this person band up linear the dispersed where this electron is going very fast so uh, that uh, that condition is we uh, we have to preserve the sign vessel so symmetry of the band where we can so recognize so basically topological insulator is insulating in the band uh, insulated is interior part and outside is the uh, this surface is metallic and but uh, so depending upon this soc this uh, spin orbit coupling sometimes this uh, this band gap doesn't open fully we have some uh, accidentally touching like a metal so that is um, uh, we call a semi metal so depending upon this accidental de degeneracy normally we have a two up spin two down spin of uh, the um, yeah this conduction band and balance band so we have here four by four so degeneracy two from uh, up spin and two from down spin so if we have a four by four degeneracy so we call a so dirac so Dirac dispersion uh, or uh, Dirac band uh, like a graphene where we don't have any time reversal so symmetry. So time reversal symmetry so preserve always. We don't need to break that time reversal symmetry. That means we have a band degeneracy. But when, uh, once we uh, break the so, so symmetry like a time reversal symmetry and inversion so symmetry, so that so degeneracy breaks. Then we have a wild point this Dirac point so become wild point and surface will be very special this uh, wild point is connected by a Fermi arc so all this uh, so this type of um, uh, this material is so theoretically so theoretically calculated but main problem is how do we recognize how do we measure this so this property where we have like a topological insulator is uh, conducting only uh, surface and bulk is insulating and and how do we recognize this uh, surface or transport not a bulk transport in a while or a direct semi metal so in spite of that we have a lot of application of that material for example we can use a, um, as a quantum so transport i uh, as a first example i uh, showed you so that is uh, this quantum Hall effect that is uh, one of the quantum transport we can use a thermoelectric and we can use a hydrodynamic uh, so because of the special charge carrier inside so and photovoltaic but i am going to talk about this quantum transport and so thermoelectric um, of, uh, of uh, some of the material uh, when we see this database so we have yeah, more than 25 percent of the ISSD database material uh, topological insulator or uh, any kind of so topology is involved in, inside so how do we grow this material we have a we develop a laboratory mainly five method which is um, known as so Chakrasky method and Bridgman method flux growth uh, chemical vapor transport and floating joints. All these five mm, methods, we can grow a variety of mm, mm, string of crystal in uh, independent of this is uh, magnetic or so non-magnetic. So we normally work on the we start from the polycrystalline, but uh, our final aim to grow a single crystal where we don't uh, need to. This measure the transport property of any grain um, uh, contribution. So that crystal will be a grain free, um, grain boundary free contribution of transport. So basically, uh, so by this, so uh, this, so, yeah, the geometry, 
we flow the electrical by making four, uh, four point uh, this contact on this our piece of sample. We measure a longitudinal resistance and the transfer uh, resistance, and which is called electrical resistance. In along the this current is called the this um, so transfer resistance and perpendicular to current we measure uh, longitudinal um, resistance. Where we can say that this is anomalous, um, so that one is um, called the Hall effect. So uh, that one is called an normal. In uh, so in so similarly, instead of uh, flowing electrical uh, current, we may, uh, we have to, um, uh, we can also create a thermal gradient. Instead of electrical uh, gradient, we also create a, a thermal gradient where this part and measure the same uh, uh, this voltage along the um, this gradient we call a Seebeck um, effect and and also in uh, this particular we call uh, this nerve effect and there is a two type of uh, uh, material mainly non magnetic and magnetic when we measure hall in uh, magnetic uh, and in a non nanometric material so uh, this be uh, linearly with field but when we apply these things in a magnetic material there is a two contribution one is anomalous contribution is uh, is due to uh, the presence of um, so the magnetic element and other one is ordinary hull so like a, a non normal hull so we call this um, this uh, uh, so this contribution we call a, a anomalous hall. In the non magnetic material, we normally measure normal value, but in a magnetic material, we measure a anomalous value. So like in a topological so insulator, how do we recognize this uh, so surface transport? So here, um, uh, one of the example is well known, this bismuth selenium tolerium, which is <laughs> well known topological insulator, where we measure so, so transport. Suppose we are measuring a uh, resistance, where so resistance is, you can see in lowest thin film, which is uh, this 20 nanometer, in so blue one, blue one is always we give a quantized mm, this value. So this quantum, mm, uh, this value is square by s when you calculate in, in term of resistance, which is 25 kilo mm, ohm, which is here, so 25 kilo ohm. So that means our transport is uh, so going through the uh, so surface, not through the bulb. When we increase the bulb, like we can make a bigger film, like here, uh, 37 micron film. Then we can see a bulk contribution also start to uh, dominate at low, low temperature, but high temperature is so totally dominated by a bulk so this contribution. So I mean, so this surface transport we can recognize only a thin film, not in a bulk. So this is the experimental, which is away from the uh, this prediction ideal value. Ideally, this value should be always at at the room temperature even. But uh, at the room temperature, we can uh, we are not able to recognize due to thermal gradient or thermal uh, excitation of uh, this transport electron. But we can only recognize when we have a very low temperature. So such a phenomena always to dominate at low temperature to to ignoring this uh, thermal uh, thermal excitation of electron. When we drop uh, this um, magnetic element inside, we can really recognize um, anomalous transport. As I said. In somatic element, when you drop the magnetic element, we have a anomalous value. So this anomalous value is always e, 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 e squared by h by doping. But this phenomena is also um, only uh, appear at very low temperature. We can see here 30 millikelvin um, is, is only recognized 
this temperature. When we increase the temperature, all this thermal gradi um, thermal excitation dominates. We need to use this thermal, um, the, all this uh, surface property of this quantum transport. But when we have uh, some uh, natural uh, magic uh, this compound like I mean the I two T four, when we make a thin film, then we can uh, yeah, recognize this uh, phenomena up to some Kelvin. Instead of many Kelvin, we can we are able to recognize up to uh, this Kelvin. So I mean, if we want to recognize this uh, anomalous all phenomena at uh, room temperature, we have to look. Uh, some high uh, temperature, uh, this naturally grown um, high TC compound, high matic tension compound, where uh, we can have such a such phenomena uh, in the thin film. But in a, a non thermometric like a nitrogen um, pipe, we, we can see this material is very sensitive to semantic field. When we apply a semantic field, like 9 Tesla, up to we can see a uh, million times of uh, resistance increase at low temperature. At 2 Kelvin, we can see this million, uh, million uh, this value of micro resistance we can recognize. So that material we can use as a semantic sensor where we can so major uh, this magnetic field um, and which, which is very sensitive in this material. Uh, only in, <laughs> not this material. We also recognize a, a lot of um, this topological material which is very sensitive in uh, in uh, in a magnetic field. More than mega percent of uh, resistance we can see in a magnetic field. And when you compare with non uh, this topological uh, material uh, like copper and pure copper and this uh, and potassium element, instead of this material is very less sensitive in uh, magnetic field. But in same conductivity, we, we can see in in other of same conductivity, the, this topological um, material really sensitive to to uh, to magnetic field. But how we recognize this surface transport again in some some uh, some topological material? So we have to make like a here two geometry we we make like one so so geometry is uh, so rectangular geometry one is a triangular geometry. So what is so difference between these two? In in a rectangular this rectangular geometry we can see two peaks here, but in a, a in a triangular so the geometry in the red curve and which belongs to triangular geometry we don't recognize surface evidence. So uh, due to so we deteriorate this surface. Uh, so surface property here by making this unusual this triangular uh, this uh, uh, geometry because this electron is uh, it is uh, is going in a complete orbit in a rectum, uh, this rectangular geometry but we, so, uh, electron so doesn't have um, uh, a complete path in a triangular geometry so uh, that means we can we are not able to disconnect this path of this electron to whole whole surface bottom and so top. That's why we have a only uh, surface transport in a rectangular geometry, but we don't have surface tran transport in a triangular geometry. So such a uh, by making unusual this uh, so uh, this geometry of the crystal, we can so re recognize surface and trans no, surface and um, uh, surface transport. And in a semantic <laughs> method, we can see also an anomalous hall uh, defect up to very high temperature. We can see here up to 100, um, up to 100 Kelvin. <laughs> we can see an anomalous transport. So this, this crystal is a hexagonal. So TC is 175 up to 100 uh, this Kelvin. You can see a, a very high anomalous uh, transport of <laughs> this crystal. When you compare 
this material to other material. So we also measure a, a series of uh, material where we can recognize all these transports in this material. And uh, not only uh, electrical, we also measure a thermal transport. And all this, uh, uh, all this thermal so transport in a topological uh, uh, a material always so dominate in compared to non so topological material where we can see here is non topological material but here is a topological material where uh, all this uh, anomalous transport is always uh, so dominant so i mean electrical and uh, thermal transport always uh, dominate and we can uh, uh, we have a very high value in a uh, topological material so um, out of this i want to thank you for your kind attention and if you have any <laughs> concern then i'm happy to answer Thank you so much, sir, for a very interesting and informative talk. Now the session is open for discussion or comments or questions. Please, we can take two questions at least. OK, yeah. please, use, uh, please use the microphone. So if there are no questions, then let's thank our speaker and give a round of applause. Thank you. OK. Thank, thank you, you, sir, for sparing your valuable time and uh, sharing valuable information for our participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, so now we move to the uh, next uh, invited talk, which is to be delivered by Professor B.K. Jansen. So before I invite him to deliver his talk, I'll just read out a brief uh, CV. <coughs> Professor B.K. Jansen is the advisor at University of Ladakh, member expert appraisal committee, infrastructure and miscellaneous projects, plus CRZ, MOEFCC, Government of India, President, National Association of Chemical Security, ex-director, School of Chemical and Ph uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences, Gujarat University, ex-director, Center of Excellence in Climate Change, Government of Gujarat, Gujarat University. A lot of experience as professor of chemistry, reader, lecturer in Gujarat University, and uh, uh, the education from University of Delhi, UG, PG, and PhD. And a very wide area of specialization. So, sir, please uh, Thank you. welcome to kindly deliver uh, the speech. Hello. This is this is to be but this is to be published by my presenter. I will take that slide. Not my own. This is insert a point. Okay, this is four pointer, sir. Yeah, four pointer. Thank you, Dr. Tiwari, for nice introduction. I don't know whether I deserve or not or not, but people believe me, so therefore I am as a generally stated. And uh, at the outset, I would like to, uh, am I audible? Or I think without this also, I am audible, right? Because I have been teaching for the last so many years, so I think my voice will not be a hurdle. So at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ved. <coughs> who has given me the opportunity to present my work, which I have done in last 20 years, 20, 25 years. Uh, 
in Gujarat University. And uh, simultaneously, I would like to congratulate him as well as his entire team for making this arrangement so wonderfully. Although the audience has, are not uh, much, much, but certainly the quality of the speakers are, uh, are admirable. This is what I will say. So coming on to my work, uh, Chairman Sir, may I have your liberty to extend my time from 30 to 35 minutes because I will be taking this much time because my idea of being here is to impress, influence, inspire, and motivate young researchers to explore the potential of calyx greens and calyx protected metal nanoparticles. There are ample opportunities, and likewise, certain challenges are also associated with them. So, the outline of my talk is that we will understand what is calyx ring, different platforms of calyx ring, functionalization of calyx ring platform, applications of calyx ring by liquid liquid extraction, solid liquid extraction. Chemo sensors for anions, cations, pesticides, nitroaromatic compounds, and organophosphate. And then SDF inhibitors we have explored, but I will not cover this. And application of calyxerin as a reducing agent as well as a stabilizing agent. These two things are very important. Reducing agent as well as stabilizing agent for the formation of calyx protected metal nanoparticles. And then as a sensor for biomolecules and heavy metal ions, and then catalysis for various CC coupling reactions. RAM and molecular logic gate. This is a work which has been done by my colleague in the physics department. They have taken our nanoparticles and I have done something on this. And then DNA interactions are being carried out by my colleagues there in the zoology department. And antioxidant, antibacterial, and topological agent studies are being carried out by in collaboration with microbiology department. They are undergoing, and I'm not you know going to present all these things. But the idea here to show is that these are the things which we have covered at Gujarat University, which is a state university having minimal you know, infrastructure. So why not you people in Central University and young can take this opportunity of working in the area of calyx chemistry. So I will go on. So let us understand what is this calyx is all about. Now self-assembling is a basic process of this physical world. You know. Electrons, neutrons, protons, subatomic particles, they assemble to form atoms, atoms form molecules and molecules with other molecules, bigger molecules, and then they, they term, you know, macromolecules. And these macromolecules may be considered as a polymers and the microcyclic compound. You know, all the macromolecules are not polymers, but polymers are macromolecules, right? So, and macrocycles, let us understand, they are described as macrostructure, which is having a large ring size with an in, with the uncharged large ring, but inherent hollow cavity. And this cyclodextrin, crown ethers, triptans, rotaxins, all these fall under this category of macrocycles. Now, when these macrocycles interact with certain analyte, certain gas, then by some by certain non-covalent interaction or by non-conventional interaction, they are being termed as supramolecules. And this now supramolecules can be divided on the time scale, like Okay, cyclodextrin and crown ethers are the first generation and second generation supramolecules. Calyx rings are classified as third generation supramolecules, which are nothing but the cyclic condensation product of phenol and formaldehyde, right? So the term calyx ring was coined by Professor Gurtsev in 1978. And the name calyx ring is derived from the Greek word meaning wash, wash shaped or cone shaped structure. It has got two zones, one is the upper zone or a lower zone, or we can say that it's a upper rim or lower rim, like this. No? It is a paratracy butyl group, and this is a phenolic group over here. So this is called upper rim, and this is the lower rim. Next, and this calyxerine family can be further divided into two categories, which are the heterocalyxerine and the heterocalyxerine. When the phenolic moiety is like heterocycle, they are termed as calyx spiral. When hetero, this, uh, uh, phenolic, this aromatic moiety is furon, then they are termed as calyx furon. And likewise, when this methylene junction group is being replaced by oxygen, then we are calling, uh, classifying it them as, as oxacalyxerine, and this is sulfur here, so we will call it a thiacalyxerine. These are the various platforms of calyx systems, and these are the, uh, no, uh, uh, 
these uh, these are the review articles which have been done by my students. So therefore, by establishing the fact that we have worked in this area sufficiently well, and this is the beauty of this calligraphy in that it has an inherent hollow cavity varying from the size three to seven also. So this is the beauty of this having the structure conical structure with the, this varying cavity. And now the wonderful part in this calyx platform is that we can functionalize them. No, we have got periphery here, you see this, like oxacalexin if you take. This can be, no, we can replace H by any functional group. We, most of us are organic chemists over here, so whatever organic group we want to introduce on this, we can introduce by certain chemical reactions. So, and uh, further, with regard to this different platform, this is a, something, a very versatile platform and a lot of work has been done on this. This is a condensation product of uh, resource marine and it, an aldehyde. This R, R can be any aldehyde, whether it is aliphatic or aromatic. So obviously, this R can be functionalized, R can be anything. This H can be replaced and this electrophilic position, elect, uh, electron rich position can be functionalized. So likewise, this was the case of resource marine, higher calyxerine, again, we can debutylate it and can functionalize it, OH is there. And this is a different, uh, it's a very good fluoride sensor, but uh, uh, this is also, you know, we have to take care that we functionalize it not with the aldehyde, because if we do it with aldehyde, then the poor final ring will be there, but when we take a ketone, R, C, O, C, H, 3, we will get calyx spiral structure, and R can be any thing. It, it can be an aliphatic or an aromatic uh, moiety, and this beta position can also be exploited with this. So, just by manipulating reactants and reaction condition, we can get a variety of molecular platforms, and thereby a large number of ways for their further functionalization, and therefore we can have a supramolecular calyx system of our choice, which can be designed and synthesized to act as a chemosensor for various light. Just see the beauty, you know, if you are having a phenol, it is, it is having a different characteristic. It has in some characteristic, but if you take resource phenol, it is entire properties are entirely different. And these two OH groups are there, right? So if you take uh, three, four, five, so likewise we can functionalize these platforms the way we want, whether we want to do it monofunctionalized, or we can put one functional group, two, four, eight, 12, even 12 functional groups can be appended to these moieties. So this is the opportunity available with us that we can synthesize the compounds the way we want to incorporate the properties which we want it to show. It may or may not show the way we want, but there will be certain increase or decrease in the properties which we are uh, you know, interested in. So further, these calyx platforms can be used to synthesize nanoparticles that we will take later. Now, why it is being so attractive? Now, this inherent cavity accommodates a variety of organic and inorganic gas to form host gas complexes. And this, this host gas influences the you know, interactions and they, uh, they, they give some signal, either the chemical or the spectroscopic signal, which is our, our interest, and then we, you know, uh, explore their properties, that's how the interactions, and therefore they have found to function, uh, give so many properties, but we will be focusing uh, in this just, and in this, uh, because my talk, I'll be showing only the application part, which we have done at our end, without taking care of the synthesis, characterization, and the sensing mechanism of that, because they have already published work, except one or two, so that we will not detail, but I will just impress upon you, influence you that, that we have done this kind of work and it proves and we have gotten good uh, citation and good publication, so therefore you can also venture into the area of calyx chemistry. So, <clears throat> so we'll be taking at metal extractant for liquid-liquid uh, uh, extraction, solid-liquid extraction, optical chemosensors, and reducing agent uh, for uh, the synthesis of metal nanoparticles. Now, we have designed this molecular octopus. This is a resource marine, which we have functionalized it, octa functionalization, and this we call as a molecular octopus, which have been used for the selective separation of thorium, uranium, lanthanum, cerium, and vanadium. And likewise, we have taken the emberlite XAD polymeric support, nitrated, reduced, diastized, and hooked our, uh, uh, this calyx system on this uh, 
these uh, polymeric support and use them for the separation and pre-concentration of various metal ions, copper, cadmium, lead, chromium, arsenic, thallium, and this is uh, again. Now these uh, cadmium, zinc, and copper, we have separated. Just what we do, we you know, take these three metal ion solution, pass the solution at a particular pH, only two will be retained, one will eluted, and then two we will separate, which are absorbed by different eluting agent. So therefore, we are able to do this business. And now, calyx as optical chemo sensor. Optical chemo sensor for anion, cation, pesticide, nitroaromatic compound, and organophosphate. You see, <coughs> I told you that uh, if this methylene junction group is being replaced by oxygen, then it is oxa. If it is by sulfur, then it is thia. Now it is by nitrogen. So we say it is a tetra nitro -aza. It is an aza calyxerine which have been used for the naked eye detection of fluoride. Just see the yellow color is converted into a red color. Just see. So this is the beauty of this compound for the detection of fluoride. And likewise, this is a pyrene functionalized oxycalexin. It is a versatile receptor for, it is a dual readout for cyanide, as well as it is a uh, colorimetric detection, and it is a fluoro fluorometric detection. What is happening here? After so many analytes, iodide, acetate, and so many anions, only cyanide is being you know, captured or cyanide is being sensed by this dipyranated oxacalyx. And when this dipyranated oxacalyx ring, which is you know, non-fluorescent in nature, but when we add cerium, it forms a complex, it becomes fluorescent in nature, but when we add chromate and arsenate, its fluorescence intensity gets quenched. So therefore, we can detect this chromate, arsenate, as well as cyanide with this. And uh, this is the some, uh, I will not go into that. Yes, this is, we will say, we have used it, you know, uh, we have recycled this dipyranated oxacalexrine. It is a good, very good sensor for cyanide, but when we add silver or copper, it changes, it, it you know, regains its original color. And But when we add cyanide, then it again gets this red color. And we have performed it for five cycles. When we add cyanide, it gets pink color. When we add silver and copper, it, it you know, color gets disappeared and it gets its original color. Okay. So this is about. Uh, let us not go into that. Now this is another dipyranated oxalic here. In previous case, we used this. This is the ethylene diamine, whereas in the previous case, we used only the hydrazine. Now this property is now making it selective for iron as well as phosphate. You see here, uh, this is with iron. You know, among so many metal ions, it sends only iron, and it gives a change in the fluorescence intensity like this. And when we add phosphate, it's in, it, gets, it, it gets to its original spectra. So it senses iron as well as phosphate simultaneously can do it. Okay. This is sensing mechanism. Again, another one is for recognition of mercury and sulfide. This is rhodamine based. This is RTOC, rhodamine based oxacalexrine. What, what we are doing? This, you know, as, uh, colorimetric detection, it forms uh, mercury, forms complex with this, and we get a change here. And in fluorescence, we get enhanced and en en fluorescent intensity. When we add mercury to this, the fluorescence intensity increases to a larger extent. Okay. So likewise, when we add uh, mercury, fluorescence intensity is increased. When we add sulfide ions, fluorescence intensity gets decreased. Okay. And now, detection of pesticides, insensitive munition, and organophosphates. Pesticide, we all know, insensitive munition is nothing but uh, N-methyl 4-nitroaniline. It is a additive used in the explosives. <coughs> So this is you know, out of so many nitroaromatic compounds. This is the uh, resorcinerine derivative. This is a tetramethoxy resorcinerine tetraquinoline acetamide. So you see, so up, among so many nitroaromatic compounds, it senses only N-methyl 4-nitroaniline, which is a insensitive munition by means of fluorescence quenching. <coughs> see. 94.75% quenching is there with this 
when we use this. And it is selective for M and A, which is nothing but an insensitive munition. Uh, this, uh, this, all these things, you know, why it is being selective or not selective, how much it is selective, we are doing all the theoretical calculation, computation modeling we are doing at our end with the help of the stranger software, we have got the state of the art software, we are doing that business at our end. But here, I just want to impress you that these are the capabilities of our Calyx platform. Now this, another platform, which is a bidensilated oxacalexarine, this is the densile chloride which has been appended to this oxacalexarine, and it is fluorescent in nature, but among so many pesticides, it senses only the pendimethylene by means of fluorescence quenching, and it is more than 90% fluorescence quenching takes place when we add pendimethylene, and rest of the you know, pesticide do not show any quenching with bidensilated oxacalexarine. <coughs> this is another, this is bisnaphthylated azacalexarine, which has been found to be selective for monocrotophos as a turn-on sensor, and for, again, insensitive munition as a turn-off sensor. So I think let me not go into that. Uh, yes, another one uh, here is, this is again uh, DPHOC. It is a new oxacalexarine, and it has found to be selective for DMCP, dimethyl chlorophosphate. It is a simulant for nerve agent. Nerve agent is a, a chemical warfare which is being used by terrorists, but uh, they, uh, we cannot use them, so we use a simulant for that, that is the dimethyl chlorophosphate, and it has been found to be very selective for this. So this is, <coughs> so uh, let me not go into that because I have to cover much more things. Again, this is for, uh, let me check, because it's a recent, yes, this compound has uh, uh, pyrinated oxacalexarine. It has been found to be selective for 4-nitrophenol and TNP, trinitrophenol, that is the picric acid. Okay, this is the moiety. This is again uh, pyrinated oxacalexarine. Here the linker is different. Previously in the case was hydrazine was the linker, then it was ethylene diamine. Here it is a carboxy group which is being linked to this. Now, this is again here, that's rhodamine based, rhodamine based oxacalexarine has been found to be selective for DECP. It is not dimethyl, it is a diethyl chlorophosphate. Again, a munition, again, sorry, a simulant for nerve agent. And we have done it, we have uh, you know, uh, tried to make a paper device. There is a bright field image and the dark field image. These are the concentration, and we get this particular image. Uh, just by using our R6OC, this is rhodamine based oxacalexarine for DECP, diethyl chlorophosphate. So we have used our Calyx platform for the detection for, of simulants of some warfare agents as well. So this is the device which we, is in process. We are making it so that we can take it to the field or take it to anywhere we want to take and then we, with our reagent and can sense it there and there itself. And it is battery operated and the device uh, uh, and uh, it is being supported by our this uh, what mobile. <coughs> so these are various platforms which we have used for the detection of various analytes which are uh, which are analyte for, which are simulant for the various warfare agent. This is the thing which we are you know, developing. It is in the process of development. Now, the opportunity. <coughs> this is the half part, please. This is the opportunity. We can introduce the functional group of our choice with already available intrinsic hollow cavity, and we can further fine tune with the desired properties. This is what we can do with this Calyx platform. But challenges are that it is sometimes it becomes very, very difficult to separate because when we synthesize these type of compound, isomers are formed. So it is very difficult to separate the isomers and to grow their single crystal. But you, the, now the techniques have emerged out and I think there are crystallographer who find it very easy to grow crystal. And if you are able to grow their single crystal, then we will have isomers, two different isomers in our hand. So when we have got two different isomers, then they may behave differently because when they are in the solution, they may, you know, the conformers may be interchanging and giving some resultant property. But when we have got two different isomers in separate state, then they may behave differently. So this is the uh, uh, separation of the isomers is a uh, uh, challenge. But uh, if you are able, to, opportunity is that if you are able to separate them, then we can 
have different properties. We can study those properties. And now challenge is again to establish the chemistry of known covalent interaction between host and gas. How they are, because there is a sort of a network, there is a jumbled up, or there is a web type of structure. How uh, the, our donor acceptor are you know, interacting with each other, what kind of interaction is taking place. We have tried to establish with the, uh, the state of the art software that is a Schrodinger, but still this is a challenge for those who are not having this kind of facility. Now, uh, nanoparticles, we know that there are a lot of applications of nanoparticles. We have synthesized gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles, copper we have avoided, but we have you know, palladium nanoparticles we have explored. Okay. <clears throat> now, as we all know that the synthesis of metal nanoparticles can be done by two ways. One is the top-down, another is the bottom-up approach, and in the bottom-up approach, there are so many methods which can be used. But chemical reduction method is used to be quite superior. So therefore, there are so many chemical methods which can be used, but we have chosen hydrazine hydrate because we can functionalize this, uh, this moiety on the periphery of our calyx platforms. So we have chosen hydrazine hydrate. So now why calyx? Now calyx, when we functionalize this periphery of our calyx platforms with hydrazine, it has a web type of structure. It has an inherent hollow cavity. So web type of structure, inherent hollow cavity, and a reducing agent in large number, maybe two, four, eight in number at the periphery. So the reducing agent acts as a reducing agent. And then this inherent hollow cavity and web type of structure facilitates to preserve its nanoform. It, it acts as a capping agent. So we do not need the reducing agent as, as well as capping agent separately. This calyx platforms serves as a reducing agent as well as, capil, as well as capping agent to provide a sufficient stability for the nanoparticles. You see, these are the various platforms which we have used. This is derived from uh, oxacalexidine. This is derived from thiacalexidine. This is derived from thia, uh, this uh, resorcinol. This is derived from calyxperol. So just see, this is octahydrazide and this is tetrahydrazide. This is also tetrahydrazide. This is polyhydrazide. You see, there are, I think, uh, uh, 12 uh, number of hydrazides are there. OK. <coughs> and so we can synthesize metal nanoparticles by simple one pot method. That is, we just take the gold solution, take our calyx platforms, which are dispersible in water, mix them together at room temperature or slightly elevated temperature up to 35, 40, or 50 degrees centigrade. Just mix them together, we get monodispersed, uh, uh, stable metal nanoparticles like gold as well as like silver here. And, uh, and likewise, similarly, we have synthesized palladium nanoparticles, uh, gold and silver nanoparticles, platinum nanoparticles by this particular method only. Now, uh, only one example I am giving, just see, we have uh, synthesized the gold nanoparticles which have been found, which have been found to be a fluorescent sensor, as a turn off fluorescence and the turn on fluorescence. It has been found to be a turn off for copper and turn on sensor for lu uh, leucine. And this is the thing which I told you, random, uh, this uh, Molecular logic gate is being taken care by physics department, and this there is a particular hysteresis is there. Physics people can understand it better that it has some, some memory component. The our nanoparticles, which are calyx protected, they have some memory element in them, so that can be explored. So now, just to uh, tell you that we have synthesized so many platforms and formed the silver nanoparticles, and they have been found to uh, sensor for these metal ions. Is a, is a gray one is a fluorescence quenching and it is the fluorescence uh, enhancement is there. These are the metal ions, these are the, some biomolecules and DNA interaction. I'm just you know, showcasing the work which we have done and it holds a lot of potential. Only these calyx platforms have done all this business for us. These are the various platforms again and by which we have formed gold nanoparticles and they are found to function for the sensor for these metal ions and these biomolecules and have shown some interaction with DNA as well. Now, again, the palladium nanoparticles have been you know, synthesized by us and which have, you know, which have shown their effective role in 
Suzuki reaction, Sonogira reaction, and Hex reaction. So it has also played. These are the various platforms which we have used and for the formation of palladium nanoparticles and these are the chemical reaction where they have, they have, they are being used for some catalytic, they have shown some sufficient good activity. Okay, now this is something which is, <clears throat> you must understand, I will tell you the mechanism of this, only this, not others. This is the diacetomido oxacalexerine. This is a calyx platform which is having a two hydrazine, sorry, though two NH2 groups, but it is not hydrazine, so therefore it has not been found to be effective for the formation of metal nanoparticles. Therefore, we have to choose some reducing agent in this case. Therefore, we choose some sodium borohydrate from the nanoparticles and we then again protect it. This acts as a protecting agent or a capping agent after the nanoparticles are being formed. So, silver nanoparticles are formed. Again, like I said, the calyx protected silver nanoparticles are formed here. Uh, this is the uh, SPR band of this. Okay, now uh, this is the absorbance of uh, calyx protected nanoparticles and then it is a, what we have done, this was the calyx protected nanoparticles, we added rhodamine B, it becomes fluorescent. This, this silver nanoparticles were not fluorescent in nature, it just showed their SPR band, not non-fluorescent in nature, but when we add rhodamine B, it becomes fluorescent in nature. This is the absorption spectra, and this is the fluorescent spectra. See, these uh, uh, silver nanoparticles, green in color, does not show any fluorescence. But when we add rhodamine B to this, it gives fluorescence, this fluorescence. Rhodamine B, this. And only rhodamine gives this third. Okay? Now, when we add, so many metal ions among various metal ions which we have tried, only silver, uh, sorry, mercury and methyl mercury works. And you see the SPR band, what we were observing at 423 nanometer, it disappeared. It disappears. Why it disappeared? Because, not, not because of the interaction, because that it forms silver mercury alloy. And it has been confirmed by our TAM and SAM images. You see, and this is the fluorescence intensity. Uh, <coughs> when we add this uh, methyl mercury, its fluorescence intensity gets enhanced. Okay, its fluorescence intensity gets enhanced because what happens? The nanoparticles are disappeared. Only rhodamine remains. So the fluorescence intensity is because of the rhodamine B. So uh, these are some other. This is the mechanism, you know, that uh, this is the silver nanoparticles. When we add methyl mercury, deformation of the nanoparticles takes place and silver mercury nano alloy is being formed. These are the some uh, evidences which we have done. And now we have tried to, you know, show it uh, uh, by coating this silver nanoparticles on the biodegradable beads. These are the silver nanoparticles. When we add this uh, calyx protected silver nanoparticles, when we add rhodamine B, it its color is like this, and this is on when we you know we add zip uh, this sorry nanoparticles are coated on zip eight their color change is like this, and when we add uh, this uh, on paper strip so these three things on biodegradable beads zip eight and paper strip. See when we add methyl mercury the color of this silver nanoparticles gets this. Okay the, on zip eight when we were this was coated. When we add methyl mercury, the color of the zip it changes like this. And uh, in this case, when we are taking a paper strip, it is a, uh, the, it is with uh, coated with silver nanoparticles. When we add our uh, methyl mercury, it color changes like this. Likewise, when we, it is a rhodamine B protected uh, uh, coating, when we add methyl mercury, the fluorescent intensity gets changed like this. And again. This is for biodegradable beads. When we add, uh, this is, this is uh, what, without rhodamine B, this is with rhodamine B. This is, these are the different color changes which we are absorbing here. And we have done it for the cell, uh, uh, taken, uh, you know, live example for this. This is a live cell imaging in the Artemia Selena. This has, the work has been carried out by the physiology department. And they could, uh, we could uh, convince ourselves that 
this methyl mercury when we add methyl mercury its fluorescence intensity is being captured in the dark field so in conclusion we have successfully synthesized various plat calyx platforms and have explored their application as metal extractants chemo sensor for anions cations pesticide narrow and we have synthesized all these nanoparticles they have got varying size 3 to 20 nanometer they are water dispersible and stability is more than 6 months they are biosensor for these uh, molecules and then uh, we have you know real sample analysis has been done it has been used as a catalyst and antimicrobial agent all these things we have done now calyxine and calyx predicated nanoparticles hold tremendous promise as sensors i think i am within time sir huh? so uh, uh, thank you very much i think all the audience here must have, i i must have you know may, you must not maybe that you not understood the whole gist but you must have been impressed that this is the work which can be is really worth exploring so uh, thus many potential applications of calyx nanofibers are just a step away and soon this challenge can be taken up by you people so that which will open the methodologies in the field of sensing catalysis and in pharmacy and again challenges and the unanswered question challenges is that you have seen that we have synthesized calyx protected nanoparticles we have shown them they work like this way but what is that what is sensing neither the nanoparticle alone can sense these analytes nor the organic moiety which has kept these nanoparticles can sense this it is a combination of these two which senses but what is there which is at periphery how the reaction takes place how the interaction takes place these are the things which are yet to be answered i am not very much satisfied we have published papers but my thirst is still not quite this is what i will say so this is from my side my research group who have been you know with whom i have been interacting and they are taking my advice and i am taking their advice they have put me and just because of them i am here in this stage and sharing their experience with you that's all and i'm very very thankful that the funding agencies believed in me and you know favored me by providing some financial assistance thank you very much for this financial assistance for this funding agency and this is my gujarat university where my entire career is there i worked in this gujarat university for last 31 years here and last year only i was superannuated from this university and uh, i welcome any sort of question or query which is there please Thank you, sir, for a very interesting and informative presentation. And you have embedded lots of information in your presentation, just in half an hour presentation. Yeah. So is the time for uh, audience to interact? Please go yeah. ahead. Uh, very large demonstration of your uh, work on Calexian. Uh, not question, but curiosity. Have you checked with the larger uh, ring of Calexian so that it can provide better selectivity because of conformational dynamic conformation? It has the fixed conformation, right? Symmetrical. Uh, and, uh, but if you have larger ring, it will have flexibility. So that can induce some selectivity in like sensing the things or what will the property of that? I'm curious to know, right? Yes. Your curiosity is well taken. And I know because we do not know how, you know, how it will behave in solution because we take spectra either the solid state crystallography, crystallography, then it behaves differently. But when it goes into solution, how it is going to interact with the solvent system and with the, in the presence of analyte. How it will rotate, how the conformation will go, in which side, which direction, we are totally clueless. Only the cumulative effect which comes out in the terms of the change in the spectra or change in some reading, that is all which we observe. But the real chemistry, how, how it is being done, what is being done, how we can, whether we can do it empirically or whether can we, you know, do something with regard to the satisfaction of a chemist. Abhi tak ko jawab nahi mila hai. I'm still in the quest. Ko, I'm not very, set, I'm not very much satisfied with the, you know, with the mechanistic details of that. We are proving it, you know, to a reasonable extent. But again, if we know it correctly, then we can apply that finding to other molecules. We are not able, able to establish the chemistry that this, if you take this, it will behave like this. Even we are using the state-of-the-art software, that is the Schrodinger software. We have done all the DFT calculation and the molecular dynamics, everything we are doing. But still, 
this is the state. I'm not able to. Yeah. In subsequent question, I have that what what concentration your uh, this collection detect that uh, mercury or arsenic? No, this is, I think these are quite obvious. It is in micromolar concentration, or it will be it will go from ppm to ppb. Okay, it is right. not. Uh, okay. It is very sensitive. Very high sensitive. It's very okay. highly sensitive. Okay, thank you. We are not doing. Do, do, yeah. It's okay. This is by default. Okay. I think you can take it for default. Because it's over. Is me? Yeah. Any. That is a very. Informative, sir. I, I I can see the very quantum and quality of the work, sir. Just I wanted to understand, sir, like in calexirin and if you compare with the MIP, how calexirin, because calexirin is a supramolecular chemistry, and if you see the MIP, molecular embedded polymer, it is also cavity specific. So if we compare both in the mm -hmm. same platform, then in the term of sensitivity and selectivity, how we can see the calexirin and MIP? Maybe uh, this molecular embedded polymer. So they have got the rigid, rigid size of the cavity. I, this is what I believe, correct? But here we have got a cavity size varying from three to seven angstrom, or maybe more, or maybe less. We don't know. And how, like you say, it is not a symmetrical molecule. It is a. It may be uh, one two. Like if it is a tetramer, it may be one two conformation, uh, like this. You know, if we are having these four things over here, so two may two. All the fours are not in this direction. One may be in this direction. Two may be lower, two may be higher. So the it may be having different point groups. The conformations may have different point groups. So it's entirely different from this polymer, uh, this MIP, because they have got particular size in everywhere. There will be a particular size in that. But here, one particular uh, system will behave in a particular way under particular conditions. This is what we have observed, and we have not compared it with MIP so far in our lab. This is what I will say. But it leaves to I leave it to you. Uh, I don't think uh, I think our colleagues performs better as far as in terms of selectivity. This is what I feel. Okay. I okay. have not worked on MIP. Sir, one more question, sir. Please. Like I am from DRDO, sir, and uh, we are working on the chemical and biological threads, sir. So in order to understand like calexirin chemistry with the chemical warfare agent, basically chemical uh, warfare agent is a electrophile in the nature. So like if you take the simulant, simulant behavior is different than the original or actual chemical warfare agent. Correct. And again, it depends upon the what is the size of that molecule and where you are detecting, whether you are going to detect in the liquid phase or whether you are going to detect in the vapor phase. Then like uh, whatever you have done, it is in the liquid phase or it is in the uh, gaseous phase? No, it is in the liquid phase. It is in the liquid phase. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, these are like, you know, today you were absent in the lecture of D.S. Rawat. He told that when one uh, drug comes into the market, it takes so many years yes, and so much yes. money. Yeah. So here, Same thing happened in doing the, the work on yes, simulants. Yes. If it works, I don't know how many people are working in the world and how many simulants are there. Yes. If they work exceedingly well, then, then we can think of, and then we will go to DRD to, you know, yes. to take our samples in, in the Biosafety Lab 3 or Biosafety Lab 4. They will do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. And this interaction can go on next two days also so yeah, please I'm, carry I'm so <laughs> due to just compulsion of the time otherwise it was going to be very interesting we could continue and we thank you sir once again thank you. Thank for you. your very interesting lecture uh, now we'll move to the last lecture okay. thank you So uh, the last lecture of this session three and today's last session, uh, we have the invited talk to be delivered by Dr. Ashish Kumar Singh. So before I invite him for the talk, I would like to give a brief introduction. Dr. Ashish Kumar Singh received his PhD degree from Banaras Hindu University in 2011. He then worked as a JSPS postdoctoral fellow uh, with Professor Kyung Zhu at Osaka, Japan, and as a DSK postdoctoral fellow with Professor BP uh, Jagirdar at IISC Bangalore.
then he is currently associate professor at department of chemistry guru ghasidas vishwavidyalaya bilaspur since 2019 his research works included the organo metallics metal organic frameworks and material sciences his current research work is uh, focused on the development of homo heterogeneous catalysis electrolysis for the activation of small molecules for chemical hydrogen storage he has published more than 60 papers in the journals of international repute along with uh, books and so on so uh, sir you are invited to kindly deliver a lecture Uh, first of all thank you very much uh, to the organizing committee uh, for uh, his kind invitation especially to uh, ved sir for uh, his interaction with me uh, since uh, past few years so uh, today i am uh, going to talk about the designing metal nano catalyst for hydrogen release from liquid phase chemical hydrogen so most of the speakers have basically talked about the organic chemistry related topic so it is quite uh, change from that so but it is still aligned with the or uh, theme of the conference so uh, basically uh, today uh, i am talk about the hydrogen energy so as everybody knows that uh, with the development of the technology uh, we are using more and more appliances and that required Uh, lots of uh, energy in form of electricity so currently we are uh, uh, using traditional source of energy like uh, uh, <coughs> fossil fuels and uh, so, some uh, water turbines are also used uh, to generate hydrogen so people are basically shifted to the renewable energy so uh, you people have seen that now uh, instead of petro petroleum based uh, vehicles we are using electric vehicles also so because uh, whatever the source of fossil fuels uh, we have it can sustain for uh, next 2 to 3 decades only so that's why uh, people are switching uh, to the renew renewable energy strictly so there are basically several uh, Uh, sources are available as a renewable energy like wind energy uh, turbine energy and solar energy and uh, biofuels and geothermal powers are also used uh, as a renewable energy source so 
our current government is uh, focusing on the renewable energy since uh, its inception in 2014. So in his first tenure, they were focused on the solar energy only. So they have installed several, several solar power plants. And recently, our uh, government has uh, launched the National Hydrogen Energy Mission in 2021. Uh, so why hydrogen? So hydrogen has uh, several logical and appreciable choice. Uh, for example, uh, it can be easily produced and utilized, store transport, and environmentally banning and recyclable. So these are the things. And hydrogen is classified onto different colors uh, based on the source from which it is produced. So, so different sources include coal, natural gas, and in non-renewable source, methane, nuclear energy, solar, and uh, any renewable energy source. So basically our government is focused on the green hydrogen production. So in green hydrogen production, basically we are using renewable energy source. So in this, uh, uh, basically electrolysis of water is used to, uh, to get the hydrogen. So, and different funding agency are uh, offering uh, projects. Uh, for example, uh, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy announced the uh, uh, hydrogen energy mission and uh, uh, call for uh, proposal for hydrogen uh, valley platform is organized, uh, is announced by the DST also. And uh, uh, green hydrogen policy is also drafted by the uh, Ministry of Power by the Government of India. And uh, some, uh, some, some protocol is also developed uh, to run the vehicles uh, on the hydrogen. So, so these approaches are basically, in this, this method basically hydrogen is uh, compressed in some, uh, some container in some cylinder and, and that cylinder is actually used in the, uh, within the, these vehicles. So, so in hydrogen energy storage, uh, the bottleneck is that uh, its transport, uh, storage and transportation is a uh, main hurdle in uh, its use. So basically, uh, uh, hydrogen is, uh, uh, hydrogen's uh, gravimetric heat capacity is very high compared to the uh, other natural gases or net, uh, than fuel, fossil fuel, but uh, it's, uh, uh, volumetric heat capacity is very less because hydrogen is available at, in the form of gas. So uh, uh, to store the hydrogen, lots of pressure is required and it is the lightest element. So even for uh, two gram uh, of hydrogen, uh, we need uh, to, uh, to, uh, to apply 22.4 uh, bar pressure to store it in one liter of container. So there are two approaches in by which hydrogen can be stored. One is the physical storage, Another is the chemical storage. So in physical storage, we are uh, basically taking some materials on which the hydrogen is uh, adsorbed or uh, it is kept in its diatomic, diatomic molecular form. And uh, in uh, another approach is chemical storage. So chemical storage is not like we are storing hydrogen in uh, some chemical. In this, what we are doing, we are choosing some chemicals which having very high percentage of hydrogen, and that hydrogen extracted from these materials at ambient conditions. So, for example, uh, we have ammonia boron. It can produce hydrogen by hydrolysis or by thermolysis. Uh, formic acid can decompose to hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Hydrogen can de decompose to nitrogen and hydrogen and uh, water can be uh, decomposed to hydrogen and oxygen. So my work, uh, which I am going to uh, discuss today, is basically on the hydrogen. So in hydrogen, uh, what is the advantage of use as hydrogen to produce the hydrogen is that it is liquid at room temperature. So we can use it uh, like normal petrochemicals to fill in the uh, tank. And it has very high percentage of hydrogen. And it can decompose to produce nitrogen and hydrogen. So, so the, the byproduct is the nitrogen, so which is uh, not reactive. So we don't need to, uh, to, to worry about the, this byproduct. We don't need to separate it. 
and uh, another thing is that as nitrogen is the byproduct and plenty of nitrogen is available in the atmosphere so we don't need to uh, to worry about uh, uh, its collection also so our uh, the drawbacks is first is the explosive so everybody knows that hydro hydrogen is explosive in nature and another thing it is stable at normal condition so it cannot decompose itself to produce nitrogen and hydrogen so some catalyst is required and another drawback is that there is a parallel pathway is also possible in which it is decomposed to nitrogen and ammonia so so first uh, hurdle that is uh, and the, the drawback that that it's explosive nature it can be overcome by using the hydrous hydrazine so it also contains 8% hydrogen which can be removed from uh, this ma material and it is much safer compared so we have uh, started uh, as we told that it is also stable at normal condition so what we did we have started to study uh, to to design the catalyst to decompose the hydrazine to nitrogen and hydrogen so this work it started with the uh, preparation of metal nano particle uh, we have used uh, prepared the metal nano particle of all the common metals uh, by simply uh, re reduction of metal salt uh, by the sodium borohydride and uh, uh, and then uh, what we found that most of the metals are either inactive or uh, having very less activity and best activity is of obtained in case of rhodium catalyst only so so this is the first result uh, uh, which is started by my senior uh, dr sanjay thing uh, he is in iit indore now so after this result uh, an obvious question arises is it possible to achieve 100% selectivity for uh, hydrogen production from the decomposition of hydrogen or not so what we started to do we have to start we have started to modify the catalyst by using the different capping agent so previously we used to sit up we have used uh, uh, pvp and uh, sps also uh, but we didn't get 100% selectivity for decomposition of hydrous hydrazine so later what we did uh, we found a very good result when we prepared the bimetallic nanoparticle so in bimetallic nanoparticle what we found that when uh, when that uh, Uh, rhodium is mixed with nickel in certain ratio we are getting complete conversion of uh, hydrogen to uh, uh, nit uh, nitrogen and hydrogen so with this result we uh, uh, result uh, here we have uh, basically one result and one uh, uh, one idea from this result so what is the idea in this result that we have used rhodium and we have used nickel so rhodium is inactive uh, uh, rhodium is showing 43% selectivity and nickel is inactive for the decomposition of hydrazine but when we uh, prepare a catalyst with a certain ratio of rhodium and nickel we are getting complete conversion of uh, hydrazine to nitrogen and hydrogen so 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 this suggests that uh, one active and inactive species can mix together and uh, can give the Uh, complete uh, selectivity for hydrogen products so by using this this idea we had tried on we had tried on other catalyst also so we what we found we have found other two results also uh, in this uh, nickel platinum and nickel iridium catalyst in which nickel is inact inactive platinum is inactive and they mix in certain ratio we are getting Uh, complete conversion of hydrazine to nitrogen and hydrogen similarly in iridium from 5 to 10% uh, 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 iridium based catalyst is showing complete co conversion of hydrazine to nitrogen and hydrogen so there is basically a catalytic synergy between the metal metals ion uh, metals so we have reviewed this also and because of uh, so what is the catalytic synergy that we have one component which is very less active or inactive another component is also inactive but when we mix in some ratio we are giving a very uh, high catalytic performance so this uh, this uh, we have reviewed in uh, 2030 and because of importance of this catalytic synergy 
uh, this work is cited more than 600 uh, citations. Later, we have tried with other, other metal cat combination also, so that we can get a much cheaper catalyst, because uh, whatever catalyst we have reported so far, uh, they are based on the noble metals, like rhodium, nickel, uh, rhodium, platinum, and iridium. So, uh, so uh, there is always search that can we reduce the noble metal content in that, or uh, can we, uh, uh, can we uh, prepare noble metal free catalyst or not? So, so initially whatever reaction we have performed that is at the room temperature. So next to what we did, uh, we have tried to change the reaction temperature. So what we found that uh, nickel catalyst which is inactive, inactive at room, inactive at room temperature, it is showing 20% cell activity at 40 degree and 33% uh, cell activity uh, at 32 degree. So, so basically, uh, uh, when we studied the thermodynamics, role of the temperature is to increase the kinetics only, not the cell activity. So here, basically, we have temp temperature induced cell activity enhancement is observed in the nickel catalyst. So based on this, uh, this result, what we did, uh, we had prepared a nickel platinum catalyst containing platinum only 1% uh, to ch check whether there is uh, temperature induced selectivity enhancements occurs or not. So what we found that nickel uh, platinum catalyst, uh, which is showing 80% selectivity at room temperature, it is showing complete conversion of hydrogen to nitrogen and hydrogen at 100 degree. Similarly, rhodium nickel catalyst, uh, whatever we reported earlier, in that rhodium nickel uh, 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 rhodium content is 80 percent. Now, when we increase the temperature just a little higher, we are getting uh, 100 percent cell activity with rhodium catalyst containing uh, 10 percent of rhodium only. So, by use of temperature induced cell activity enhancement, we, we are able to reduce the noble metal content from 7 to 1 percent and rhodium content from 80 to 10 percent. Uh, with this, uh, is it possible to prepare completely noble metal free catalyst or not? So we are getting two ideas. One, by the changing the composition of by, uh, by making the bimetallic catalyst, we, we are able to decompose hydrogen to nitrogen and hydrogen selectively. Another is that temperature has role on the selectivity enhancement. So initially, we have tried on the room temperature for, for preparation of noble metal free catalyst and. Uh, check its activity for hydrogen decomposition to get the hydrogen and nitrogen. So later what we did, uh, we, had, we had prepared uh, noble metal free catalyst and check their activity at higher temperature also. But we didn't get complete conversion uh, to the uh, hydrogen and nitrogen also. So last what we did, we have add some additive in the solution so that uh, uh, Catalytic activity may be enhanced. So this is the uh, final result. We are getting the first noble metal free catalyst uh, for complete decomposition of hydrogen to nitrogen and hydrogen. So uh, because this is the first catalyst uh, uh, and that that activity is observed in basic solution at 70 degree temperature. So because this is the first catalyst, uh, we have published it in the JAX and uh, we got uh, two patents also from uh, Japan and uh, from US also. So there are, uh, we check the effect of composition also. So nickel is inactive at room temperature, iron is inactive at room, to temperature, uh, at room temperature and all the catalyst based on nickel and iron is inactive at room temperature but when the temperature is increased and in the presence of base, the nickel iron catalyst with equimolar ratio is showing the complete conversion of hydrogen to nitrogen and hydrogen. Here the, not only the base, uh, its nature is also important. So we have done the uh, reaction in absence of base also and uh, uh, using one salt and one uh, weak base also. So uh, only the strong base, base like NUH is important to uh, enhance the selectivity and that is depends on the concentration of base also. When the ratio of base is 1 is to 1 with respect to uh, hydrogen, we are getting the uh, complete selectivity in the reaction. 
The possible reason for effect of alkaline IoT might be understood uh, by, by pathway 2, we are getting uh, nitrogen and ammonia. So in ammonia, it's basic, but, but when we add NOH, it makes catalyst surface highly basic, so which may be unfavorable for the basic formation of hydrogen. Another group has reported uh, role of base uh, after our re report uh, that it is due to the uh, decrease in the undere undesirable hydrogenium ion in aqueous solution, and on the other hand, it facilitate, facilitate the privileged NH bond cleavage during the decomposition of hydrogen to nitrogen and hydrogen. So we have prepared the noble metal uh, free catalyst based on other metal also, and but we are getting the selectivity in the nickel iron catalyst only. Further challenges for use of hydrogen as potential chemical hydrogen storage material is Synthesis of novel metal free catalyst with faster kinetics for hydrogen generation from hydrous hydrogen. Then test of durability of prepared catalyst. So basically whatever catalyst we are preparing, we are checking for two, three cycles for uh, catalytic reaction. So but if you, we have to use uh, this catalyst for uh, hydrogen generation and for onboard use uh, in a vehicle, so we ne need to test the durability for several hours also. And uh, hydrogen can be decomposed to nitrogen and hydrogen in presence of some suitable catalyst. But uh, development of method for production of hydrogen at mild condition is also a challenging task. So uh, means uh, hydrogen production, production from nitrogen and hydrogen uh, each, each, each is not feasible. So normally nitrogen and hydrogen when they mixed at uh, diff, uh, at certain ratio, there is production of ammonia instead of hydrogen. And development of system for use of hydrogen in automobile is uh, also uh, required. So basically current, currently the production of uh, hydrogen is based on the ever process for ammonia synthesis followed by basic process in which uh, uh, that the, the ammonia produced from this is used to get the hydrogen. Recently, Nishibiyashi and groups have uh, prepared the pincer uh, complex uh, in which uh, molybdenum and uh, tungsten based uh, complex is used to activate the nitrogen to get the hydrogen. And they have proposed a mechanism also, but uh, it's still uh, in this the production of hydrogen occurs from the uh, acid rather than the hydrogen itself. So in conclusion, hydrogen is a potential source of energy for future. However, the cost of hydrogen production or hydrogen storage required to reduce. Hydrogen production from chemical hydrogen storage materials such as hydrogen requires suitable nanocatalyst. And uh, understanding of technological steps and safety issue is required to further utilize this catalytic system. Thank you. So I would like to acknowledge uh, Department of Chemistry, uh, Guru Ghasidas University, Bilaspur. SMST, ITBSU, IPC, Bangalore, uh, AIST, Japan, and Department of Chemistry, BSU, and uh, several funding agencies who had provided me the fellowship during my uh, research, uh, like CSIR, GSPS, uh, UGC, and SCRP, and DST. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashish Kumar Singh, for your very nice and very interesting presentation. Now is it's an open for questions. At least one or two questions we can take. Uh, uh, microphone. I, I don't have close time. I just uh, I like to know what is I am like your research because you are working on hydrogen. Yes. Okay. So, like the major problem with the, this hydrogen uh, uh, energy source is transport and, and uh, what you call uh, storage. Uh, storage. Yes. So, is it possible in nearby future that Whatever the process we are doing in laboratory, mm -hmm. we can have a setup in the what you call in vehicle itself, mm -hmm. and like you know your hydrogen, we can have hydrogen there, and we can have a setup, and the hydrogen will be generated there itself, and it, it will be used as a resource. What is the yeah, chance? What is actually, the future I, about I, this? I, I uh, have prepared uh, recent of hydrogen. There is uh, almost uh, uh, 20 moles of hydrogen exposure. 
So 20 moles of hydrogen means if you are multiplying it by 22.4 liter, mm -hmm. so it will be 44.4 uh, liter <coughs> gas is produced. 22.4 liter uh, liter uh, gas is produced. So if if you uh, corresponding to that, if you are using hydrogen gas, so you have to compress uh, it uh, uh, to 22.4 bar yes, uh, to store in one liter. Instead of that, if you are using hydrogen, which is a liquid at room temperature, yes, yes. you are keeping it at one bar pressure. Yes, yes, yes. So that's that is the advantage. Now, however, its toxicity is still a uh, problem. So we are working on that also. So somehow I combined it with some chemical so that uh, during its use, uh, means when it is not in use, it is in the complex form and it is not hazardous to the uh, human being. But when we have to utilize it in the vehicle, it can easily uh, break down and uh, get the hydrogen, and from that we are getting hydrogen. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, just I wanted to understand, like, uh, if you are uh, talking about the poisoning of the catalyst, like, like you have used the noble metal catalyst as well as a non-noble metal catalyst. Yeah. So if you talk about the poisoning of catalyst, so which that, that, catalyst that, is that more is prone? That, that we have observed in case of, uh, we have worked on formic acid also. In that case, there is formation of H2 and CO. So the carbon monoxide is easy to bind with the surface of metals. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in that case, we, we require to use noble met metal based catalyst because uh, on noble metal catalyst, uh, that car carbonyl group is not easily binding. So in that case, uh, if you are looking for the for formic acid, basically palladium based catalyst is important. But in our case, in hydrazine, hydrazine itself is not uh, prone to bind with the metal. It is act as a reducing agent. And here we are getting hydrogen and nitrogen. So nitrogen is also not a complexing agent. So, so that problem is not with the hydrazine. But its uh, explosive nature and toxicity is the, the main problem. So oh, okay, so what about the instantaneous reaction, instantaneous production of the hydrogen? Like, why we should uh, uh, think of the storage of the hydrogen? Why we should not think it of the onboard uh, instantaneous release yeah, of the hydrogen? This whatever catalyst I have developed, uh, that we uh, I have used for the uh, onboard hydrogen production only. So that's why uh, that is the problem with the green hydrogen. So green hydrogen, uh, basically we are getting from the water. So water splitting is required very high energy. And uh, that energy we basically get from the solar energy or from the electrical energy. So uh, for, for hydrogen production from the water, uh, we cannot uh, use uh, that for the onboard hydrogen production. Water cannot, we cannot use for the hydrogen production on board. But uh, in our case, in hydrogen, uh, the catalyst we can simply prepare in a, uh, some uh, RV by we are just weighing the metal salt and adding CTAB as capping agent and he has the added sodium borohydride as reducing agent and directly we have added the hydrogen. And uh, hydrogen is produced and uh, we used that uh, uh, the, the slang line through which that uh, gas can be go to the External, uh, external means whatever devices we are using, uh, we can directly use it uh, onto through that. And what about the disposal mechanism for this type of a noble metal? What will be the disposal mechanism? How we can dispose of after so using that? For, so, so, so for uh, for uh, noble uh, uh, noble metals, so they are not easy to discard because in, they are stable in acidic and other condition mm -hmm. also. But uh, we have to use uh, suitable. Uh, Oxidizing as they uh, to convert it into the uh, ionic form, like uh, we can use aqua regia or other things. But uh, uh, if you are looking at the noble metal uh, free catalyst, so they, they are all uh, easily soluble in the uh, mineral acid like HCl. So like any metal, iron is easily uh, dissolved in the HCl, etc. Et so we can dispose them easily by using the HCl or some other. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, what are the precautions you, uh, one should take uh, to avoid the production of ammonia as a byproduct in the process of uh, you know, producing so hydrogen so from so, so hydrogen? Uh, 
So, so that is the main reason uh, we are not getting complete activity and cell activity. So, so we are getting some catalysts which are showing uh, uh, means whatever research I have shown here that is basically uh, de dependent on two things. Uh, one, we, uh, the catalyst should uh, activate the hydrogen either in form of uh, nitrogen and hydrogen or in the ammonia and nitrogen. Another thing is that we should increase the cell activity. So what we done the sequentially uh, in that uh, we are basically trying to increase the cell activity towards the production of hydrogen. So whatever uh, we finally got that role of base is uh, actually important. So we have later study means whatever uh, uh, work I have shown so far. Uh, later we work on that also. So what we found that uh, uh, the role of base is very important. We can increase the base. Uh, even the novel metal catalysts are showing very faster kinetics for the decomposition of nitrogen and hydrogen. And this uh, non-novel metal catalyst, you have used the iron nickel. Is it alloy or? Yeah, that is alloy. alloy. So, so what we are doing that uh, we are um, taking the uh, nickel chloride and iron sulfate salt in equimolar ratio. And then we have added uh, a strong uh, reducing agent like sodium borohydride. So in present, and uh, we have instantly added that to the metal salt solution and immediately the nanoparticle is formed. So if we are using some uh, weak reducing agent, so there is possibility of heterostructure or uh, core cell type of nanoparticle. Yeah, because uh, yeah. iron also it has tendency to form oxides as well as that nickel. Yeah, yeah. Nickel goes uh, readily yeah, that that possible. also we have observed that uh, if uh, I had prepared the nickel iron catalyst and wet it for uh, two to three minutes, it is getting easily oxidized to its uh, oxide form. So uh, within one or two minutes, we have added the hydrogen also into the solution. So once hydrogen is added to the solution. Uh, the catalyst become more stable compared to the excess prepared catalyst. And we have uh, checked the activity for three to four cycle also and the activity remains the same. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so, so much. Once again, let's so give a round of applause to the speaker. Uh, thank you very much everyone uh, after uh, all day uh, just okay. discussion. Yeah. Uh, your people are present here. So, yeah. yeah. yeah please. Yes. The potential of the presentation. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. And I've been following the efforts that are going, thank you, yeah. in the uh, field of uh, what people are trying to do with the water splitting. And you rightly yeah. pointed out that it's an energy intensive process. Yeah. And uh, the counter argument of the researchers in the field is that we can take renewable energy either through light or through any other source, right, yeah. uh, to tackle that issue. Right? And there have been translational efforts in that direction already. Mm. Now, when it comes down to hydrazine, mm. uh, what is the natural source of hydrazine that will be utilized? Uh, How would you get the bulk hydrazine? So, actually, then the question comes that what will be the source? What will be the energy yeah. that will be invested in the production of hydrazine? Right? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, means, uh, uh, you cannot means uh, compare the water and hydrazine uh, in the manner that uh, if you are looking for the uh, for the normal usage of uh, uh, hydrogen means if you uh, you are pro uh, you don't uh, want to use it on on board you can use water and can produce hydrogen from there like uh, in home so professor uh, daniel nocera has reported artificial leaf also. Uh, so on a semi silicon semiconductor, he has coated on one side uh, uh, cobalt uh, catalyst and another side uh, some metal alloy is used uh, on simple silicon chip. And uh, it, it, uh, light is passed on it and there is production of hydrogen. But the amount of hydrogen which is produced, that which is very less. So if you are looking for the onboard hydrogen production, so water is not an option. Because uh, that much uh, the am amount of energy which is required to produce hydrogen from water, that is. But if you are looking for normal usage, uh, like uh, our government is also trying to do its uh, production of green hydrogen mm -hmm. and use uh, it, 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 and after production, that hydrogen is compressed and used in 
commerce. You know. so, 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 so in that case, uh, water is uh, uh, more important. So there are two reasons why I asked this question. Sorry, I'll probably discuss it later. Yeah. I'll yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you so well, much once thank again. You. Uh, now, I, uh, our organizers, if you have any announcement, please go ahead. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, attending this conference whole day, first day of the program. And I think you people are tired. So now we can just bind up this session. And tomorrow again, we will meet at 10 a.m., uh, not 9.30, just like today. So still you have more time than yesterday. <laughs> and uh, we will uh, do in the same manner, but not here, because this is very big hall. Uh, for inaugural function, actually, we hired this one. So tomorrow, in front of this, we will do here. But uh, poster session and uh, lunch will be here. And tomorrow evening, cultural program will be there with dinner. That will be here only. So And uh, poster presentation, I think all uh, participants are knowing about their routine, how they will be presented. And uh, I think you are also knowing about the, your awards and all about poster that uh, Rajdeep has shared his things with you people. So present your poster nicely. So you will be benefited with that. Um, in, uh, you will get some uh, membership also and some prize also. So don't uh, just present like poster simple. Just put it here and you are moving here and there. Your points will be there on, based on your uh, attendance also. If you are presenting only today, tomorrow you are not here, then you will lose your marks. Don't think that today you have finished and your marks are secured. It is not like that. I am telling you, if you 25 or 27 who presented today, if tomorrow or day after tomorrow you are not here, then you will be out of race. So be here and attend. If you want to move here and there, Saturday there and Sunday you can move here and there. I will help you. So thank you to all of you.